Well, good morning, everybody. I see we have a huge audience this morning. And I want to welcome everyone to the Rainbow Center QLA CLE. And this is designed for all of our volunteers who are going to be volunteering at the new uh, Rainbow Center QLA Clinic that's going to be opening next month. And we're really blessed to have a bunch of fabulous, well-qualified, and auspicious uh, speakers today. And today we are starting off our program with Professor Terry Price. He runs the health law program at the University of Washington School of Law. He's also a professor of family law and previous to becoming his auspicious law professor career or professorial, uh, he worked as a social worker doing good across the world and especially in this area and also worked with the legislature on family law issues and legislation. So please welcome Professor Price. So um, thank you, Dominique, for that introduction. Uh, I feel like I have been doing family law issues my entire career, just in a bunch of different venues and different, um, uh, different uh, career types, but still working with families. And what I love about working in family law is that it's an ever-changing field. Just this, just checking to make sure that we're on, in sync here. Um, that just this year, the, a judge in uh, New York City said that a Brooklyn woman could use Facebook to serve divorce papers. And so I think if you want to do kind of cutting edge work um, uh, and certainly meaningful work with families, uh, there's no better place to do it than family law. Um, I will wait for the day when Washington will allow a service of process by Facebook. Um, I think it's not going to be uh, that far along. And certainly we know that um, text messages are frequently used as evidence in family law matters. So the, the phone and the, and the internet are going to continue to play a role. I'm going to talk about uh, six topics this morning. It's going to be an introduction to family law, so it's going to be a little bit of a rush through. Um, but we're going to talk about first the status or nature of the relationship. Um, and then with children, in a family law matter, there must be a parenting plan and a child support order. Also, when you're, when you're working in a family law matter, generally a dissolution, there is also property division. Sometimes there is spousal support. In Washington, that's called maintenance. And then lastly, some additional issues about unmarried parents, parentage, surrogacy, and adoption in Washington. That's what we're going to cover. What is, one of the things about, that makes Washington unique in dealing with family law is that it is a mandatory court form state. Um, most, most of the filings that are done in family law are already um, mandatory forms, uh, pre-reviewed uh, pre um, and standard forms. What I love about that is that means that everybody is using the same form, from Bill Gates, were he to get divorced, to um, somebody with way substantially fewer means. Everybody would use the same forms. Uh, we're right now in a slight evolution of those forms in Washington. They have been, the next version of them has been promulgated uh, for review. They are on the court website. You can find them with this link. Um, and uh, they are what are called plain language forms. So the forms that we use now are, um, still have a lot of terms that are you know, terms of art uh, or require some additional knowledge to use them. These plain language forms are, um, are being promulgated so that uh, uh, pro se's, people who represent themselves, will have a better, better understanding of the forms. They, as I understand them, they will, um, they're for review now. They're going to start to be rolled out around January, and I think they will become mandatory in April, April 2016. So the first issue to focus on is what's your marital status? What is the marital status of the parties that you are working with? Uh, since, since 2007, Washington has had state-registered domestic partnership law that is codified under RCW 2660. Uh, there were three bills 
uh, dealing with state registered domestic partnerships in 07, 08, and 09. Since 2009, so, um, partnerships were entirely equal to marriage. The last bill was called Everything But Marriage. And so they were entirely equal except for that word married. Uh, after June 2014, the only state registered domestic partnerships that remain in Washington are ones where one member is 62 years or older. Why is that? Because in 2012, we had marriage equality. So once there was marriage equality, then there was a, um, a, a push to either um, to apply the rules equally to everyone, regardless of, of uh, sexual orientation. So for, for folks who, were, um, who wanted to get married who were same sex or opposite sex, they could get married. For folks who didn't want to get married, then one partner had to be 62 years or older. And the thought about that from the legislature's point of view was that um, there are certain benefits that people didn't want to forego that may have been uh, changed or diminished based on a marital status. And so then, and generally those are retirement benefits, and the legislature picks 62 as the kind of cutoff. So now for everybody, um, you can have a state registered domestic partnership um, as long as one partner is 62 or older. And otherwise, if you want to join in a relationship, in a legal relationship, um, then it's marriage for everybody. For those who had a state registered domestic partnership um, and where the partners weren't 62, uh, one of the partner wasn't 62, then by June 30th, 2014, they either had to marry or divorce or the state would marry them uh, and, their, um, and they would receive a letter in the mail, congratulations, you are married. Uh, the, um, the date of marriage is the date of the original state registered domestic partnership so that for property rights and things that had been established during the domestic partnership and converted to the marriage, they would just continue on. So some of the clients that you might be working with um, uh, might not be aware that their status has changed and that they are actually married um, if, they, um, if they miss the notification. Uh, some other folks that you might work with that have raised issues were people who went to other places, other countries to get married, to get married, such as Canada, uh, before we had marriage equality in, uh, in the all 50 states. Um, and so they may have some questions about their status based on um, their, previous, and their previous actions in another country. There are still couples, even though we have, we have evolved as a state and a nation in terms of marital status, there are still couples who live together without a formal marital status. In Washington, we call this committed intimate relationships, or CIRs. Um, they used to be known as meretricious relationships, but um, the word meretricious apparently relates to prostitution. And so the court has updated its um, its use of the words to committed intimate relationships. And they have some limited property rights uh, in, those, in those relationships. But because it lacks a formal status, the question is how do you prove that relationship in order to qualify for those rights? Um, and the court has laid out the five part test for committed intimate relationships. So these are people who didn't have state registered domestic partnerships and who didn't get married, right? Just the, the old fashioned, we're just living together. And the, the court has laid out these five prongs. Has there been continuous cohabitation? What was the duration of the relationship? What was the purpose or, of the relationship? What was the intent of the parties? And whether there was a pooling of resources uh, and services for mutual benefit. Those five prongs the court is going to look at to determine whether an actual committed intimate relationship exists. The continuous cohabitation prong has generally been code language for monogamy. And in some of the previous cases where the parties were not monogamous, 
Um, it didn't matter where they were living, the court, uh, the court rejected a uh, committed intimate relationship because um, it held that they didn't, they didn't meet all of the requirements. And then life changed again uh, for us, for the whole country in 2015, in June 2015, with the Obergefell versus Hodges case. This was the Supreme Court case on marriage equality that came down, I think, uh, June 26, 2015, which is um, Justice Kennedy's favorite day. Uh, because th that was the day uh, for three of his um, historic LGBT cases, um, Lawrence, um, uh, Windsor, and then Obergefell. Obergefell. Um, and I just want to read a bit of the, of the opinion um, because the language is, is just beautiful. No union is more profound than marriage for it, it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than they once were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would, be it would misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek, they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. So in this case, the Supreme Court reversed the Sixth Circuit uh, ruling that um, that uh, there was no marriage equality for same-sex couples. Um, this has opened up, so now we have marriage equality throughout the 50 states. Uh, there has been um, some backlash that we have seen uh, in terms of, I think, unnamed persons who feel like it is not within their um, job description to issue marriage licenses for same-sex couples, uh, and that will be dealt with, those kind of skirmishes will be dealt with, um, I think generally on a case-by-case -case basis. There will be some other issues um, related to marriage that I think that LGBT couples traveling through the country will have to worry about, and we'll talk about those later when we talk about parentage. Uh, but we do have now the law of the land, all 50 states, is marriage equality. Now, one of the things that the Supreme Court did not touch on, however, that I'll just mention briefly, it's still an outstanding issue, is um, the level of scrutiny for cases involving LGBT persons and couples. Both in Windsor and in Obergefell and a number of other petitions that went to the Supreme Court, the advocates asked the Supreme Court to find a higher level of scrutiny um, or review for cases dealing with LGBT folks so um, as, uh, as a protection against discrimination. And in all of those cases, the Supreme Court did not touch that issue. So as a national policy, that is still an open question. Here in the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit actually has found heightened scrutiny for cases uh, pertaining to LGBT folks. So here in the Ninth Circuit, we have that but that is a circuit by circuit decision at the moment uh, and not, there is no national policy on that. The nice thing about marriage equality in all 50 states is this idea of, of um, marriage recognition is no longer a question. Uh, and there have, were questions previously about whether people married in one place could be divorced in another place. Um, and so now I think that will actually even out um, the, all of the states will have to recognize marriage and then all of the states will have to recognize divorces or, or perform divorces for marriages in other places. Do I think there could be skirmishes? Yes. I think that there are, um, you know, every day we read about individual judges here and there um, uh, who, who do or don't want to, well, we, we don't hear about the ones who do, we hear about the ones who don't want to participate in, the, in this new uh, legal reality. Uh, but other states, even with marriage equality, may not recognize non-married couples, those committed intimate relationships that I was talking about, 
those state registered domestic partnerships that still exist. And so for those people, they need to consider um, other additional pieces of documentation, powers of attorney, medical decision making forms, if they travel to states which could potentially be hostile, um, hostile jurisdictions. I put this cruise ship on this slide because uh, Florida has, has been known to be a hostile jurisdiction for LGBT folks traveling to Florida, and so the something to consider for people um, when they travel is uh, they, might, they may not want to do it, and it is expense to do their paperwork, but it actually would be a protection for them. Um, the famous uh, or infamous case of folks from Washington, uh, uh, two women, uh, longtime uh, partners, I can't remember if they were state registered domestic partners here at the time, with their children, went to a cruise uh, in Florida. One of the women had a major stroke and the hospital wouldn't let the other partner into the hospital to see her, claiming she had no rights, even though they had all of their documentation. Um, the, um, they let her in at the very end, just as her partner died, unfortunately. And then that caused the president, President Obama, to issue an executive order requiring any hospital that accepts Medicare or Medicaid funds to, um, to uh, not only permit, but uh, to not prohibit in any way the um, visitation of same-sex partners. Um, and that, that's great, and, and that is as good as he is in, uh, in office, and then the next president can decide whether that is going to remain in an executive order. So moving on from status, let's talk a little about parenting. So in a dissolution with children, there must be a parenting plan and a child support order. Now, parenting, the notion of parenting has changed over time. The early concepts of children, and actually of wives, was that the husband or father possessed them. They were property. Women had no separate identities, um, for the uh, not legally anyway, uh, for the lo longest time in, co in colonial and pre-colonial times. Um, and then somewhere in the 18th century, this concept shifted that small children um, should be with their mothers because there is what was called an early years presumption presumption that small children um, need to have the care and comfort of their mothers. This all got thrown up into the air and rethought and recalculated in the 1970s with the changing notion of gender roles. Um, and in, by the 1990s, all states shifted to a gender neutral standard, which is known as the best interest of the child standard. Um, it is the, under that standard, every case is to be determined from the point of view of the child, not the parents. What is in the best interest of the child from the child's point of view? It is a very squishy standard. It is very fact specific. Um, it is difficult to counsel clients about it because the, the, it depends on the parties, the facts, and the court. Um, and all of those could be a revolving entity um, and it is very difficult to overturn on appeal. I only know of a handful, small handful, of cases that the parenting decision was overturned on appeal because the judge, the trial judge, has such wide discretion in those cases. RCW 2609-002 codifies our best interest of the child standard. Um, the best interest of the child shall be the standard by which the court determines and allocates parental responsibilities. The best interests shall, are served by a parenting arrangement that best maintains a child's emotional growth, health and stability, and physical care. So the idea is that even in the dissolution of the parents, the child should have as much stability and, and routine as is possible to create because it's the stability that the legislature has determined is the most important factor for the child's development. Washington, as I said, is a mandatory court form. There's a mandatory form called a parenting plan. 
The parenting plan has three goals. It is to lay out the residential schedule, what some states call physical custody, we don't use that word here, but is the residential schedule, where does the child reside, um, to determine the dispute resolution mechanism between the parents, so because the court does not want parents coming back to court every time to resolve disputes, and also to allocate decision making for the child, what we call, what other states call legal custody, who makes the decisions about the children. And there are some, some uh, standard decisions that need to be considered, such as educational decision, um, and non-emergency health care decisions are part of the parenting plan. In the new forms, they have taken out um, uh, religious upbringing as a decision, and generally that's considered to be a joint decision. Um, each parent can raise the child as they want to. Um, in, in most instances, unless there has been either some reason why one parent shouldn't be involved in that at all, or a history of the parties agreeing to raise a child as um, in one particular religion and devoting substantial resources to that. Uh, but decision making can also involve other subjects such as um, driving lessons, tattoos, haircuts, piercings. I mean, the, depending on how elaborate uh, these are and, and how close the, the, the young person is to um, 18 at the time the parenting plan is done, these may actually be very current issues for the parents to decide whether, the, um, whether they want to include it in a parenting plan. Generally, the default on parenting decisions, even with divorced parents, is that it will be joint decision making with, um, with interaction and communication between them. That is the default. That doesn't apply to every couple, but that is the default. Presumed to be joint decision making. Uh, in Washington, regarding the parenting time, we call this the primary residential parent. Who is the primary residential parent? Uh, we don't use the words visitation and custody. Um, parenting time comes down to a very a uh, detailed look at the calendar to try to figure out what times the child is living with the primary residential parent, what times the child is living with the other parent. This can be very complicated in terms of transfers um, and in terms of school schedule. And the, actually the new forms, the plain language forms, actually do make this somewhat easier to determine holidays, birthdays, special occasions, um, so that uh, unrepresented parties can uh, fill out these forms um, in a more meaningful way than just the, what you don't want to have happen in a parenting plan is you don't want the whole plan to say reserved, 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 um, because then any kind of reviewing court will have no idea what the plan was supposed to be. RCW 2609-187 lays out the factors to be considered for the um, time and frequency of visitation. There, you see, I, I violated my own, my own statement that we don't use the word visitation. OK, note to self, change this slide. Um, it, but the, the frequency of transfer or interaction depends on the child's age, the geographical distance of the parents, um, the work and school schedules, all of that has to be figured in to the plan to make it workable. Um, and whether or not there needs to be a neutral place to transfer the child, or whether the parents can see each other during the transfer, or whether the transfer should happen, uh, of parenting time should happen when uh, at the end of the school day, so that the one parent sends the child to school and the other parent receives the child from school. But again, these are, these are plans, these are uh, things that are on paper. This is not generally how people, one, conceive of their parenting style, and two, not how they um, uh, live their lives. And so a parenting plan, dare I say, is, on, is, is only as good as the piece of paper and is hard to actually 
uh, make it work. And particularly as you get years out from the parenting plan, it's even harder to make it work because so many things have changed over time. Um, one of the things that goes into how workable it is is how flexible the parents are. And, uh, and I always say that if the parties had good communication during the marriage, even if they're divorced now, if they had good communication during the marriage, then they will have the flexibility to make the plan work. If they had bad communication style during the marriage, um, when I say bad, I should really say a difficult or hostile communication style during the marriage, then no piece of paper is going to make that go better. Uh, and I know, certainly know examples of people who will live or die by that paper, but they will not be flexible about you know, a school holiday or, or, or something. One of the things that I think is a great bugaboo about parenting plans is this concept of makeup time. Do you allow the parties who miss their parenting time to make it up? I personally think that that, although you know, well-intentioned, I think the road to hell is paved with good intentions because it is difficult to track makeup time. In the same way that an employer who allows you to track comp time is, is, has, to, has really got to be uh, believing that their employee is telling the truth because it is incredibly difficult to track. And so I think if the parenting plan says makeup time, then that is going to be an additional hurdle for the parties um, in terms of tr tracking. Also, the legislature has laid out um, mandatory and permissive limitations to parenting. So, and this is in 2609-191. So these are the limiting factors. The mandatory ones are if the parent has a history of abandonment, abuse or neglect, um, or um, I think it's substantial unwillingness to fulfill parental functions. I can't remember exactly how the statute is um, off the top of my head this early in the morning, uh, how the, the statutory language. But there are mandatory ones, and the mandatory ones also apply not only to the parent, but also could apply when the parent is living with someone who has a substantial history of abuse or neglect of a child, particularly sexual, uh, being a sexual offender. And so, um, those are the mandatory uh, 190, what are called 191 restrictions. And then there are permissive restrictions. Should somebody's parenting time be limited because they are um, a substance abuser, because they, use, they engage in um, uh, a, a hostile use of, a, a abusive use of conflict. Um, so there are permissive ways to, that, that could be limited uh, parenting time, and then there are some mandatory ones for some particular issues that the legislature has laid out as more compelling and more worrisome for the safety of children. I think the thing to step back and know about most documents with dissolutions is that 96% of them in the state are resolved by the parties in some kind of settlement. Only about 4% go to trial in any given year. So that means that the court is likely not going to be the one to put these parameters in. The parties are going to be putting the parameters, limiting fa factors in about each other. Um, and that some of that will have to get worked out in the settlement uh, process that they do. But most of these, an overwhelming majority, 96%, settle and only a rare number of them actually go to court. An actual uh, judge or commissioner in a temporary hearing would put, would um, order uh, limitations to parenting. Oh, and going back, uh, for 30 years, Washington has not permitted LGBT status to be a limiting factor for um, for parenting time, going back to 1983 for a case called Cabo Quinto. Um, and so, which is nice to know, we come from um, a state that's on the right side of history. Once there is a parenting plan, there may be some occasion to want to change the parenting plan, what's called a modification of the parenting plan. 
That statute is found under 2609-260, Parenting Plan Modifications. Um, however, the legislature has set a very high bar to modifications because, again, the legislature values stability more than anything else for the child and uses that if the, if the in child's environment can be stable, then that is the best environment for the child to continue to grow and develop and mature. So it has put in both a procedural and a substantive uh, bar to, the, to, to modifying a parenting plan. In order to modify the plan under the law, there has to be a substantial change of circumstances in the non-moving party or child that was unknown to the court at the time of the original plan. Uh, so that's a number of factors. So first of all, the, the frequent scenario is the parties get divorced because one is an alcoholic. Let's use that example. The al alcoholic gets sober and wants now to modify the parenting plan because she or he is now sober. That is not the, a substantial change of circumstances in the non-moving party. That would be the moving party. So that does not qualify under the under the statute because that is the person who wants the change is also the one who's saying I have a substantial change of circumstances. So it has to be the non-moving party or child. Something discovered after the initial parenting plan was ordered that is a substantial change that would warrant the, a, a revision of the parenting plan. They're very difficult to get. There are other, there's a procedural barrier as well, which is called an adequate cause hearing. And there has to be an adequate cause hearing uh, before you proceed to any kind of trial on a modification. And it is a separate hearing, all on paper, so nobody appears anywhere. It's cheaper that way. Um, and they, people submit affidavits. The moving party submits an affidavit, and then the responding party replies uh, to it. And, um, to put out on, in writing why there is adequate cause to proceed to this modification. If you don't get past the adequate cause hearing, that's it, done, end of story. So it's cheaper and easier for parties than having to worry that the parenting plan is going to be modified. Um, interestingly, we can compare that to Oregon, the way they do it in Oregon. So in Washington, you have to have the adequate cause hearing first before you do anything. In Oregon, you have the same adequate cause requirement and the same substantial change of circumstances requirement, but they do their adequate cause hearing on the first day of the modification trial. So what does that do for the litigants? That means that they don't know going in that day whether they are going to a modification trial or whether they are just going to a hearing. So they have prepared for trial and gotten all of that together all, you know, with the possibility they can just be bounced out. Sorry, Oregon. In my mind, that seems like uh, not only a waste of judicial time, but it also seems like a great unfairness to the parties. So I think our system in Washington, where you have to have the adequate cause hearing before you ever do anything going down that road, is actually much substantially fairer to the litigants. But the idea is once the parenting plan is in place, it should take a high bar to change it because children rely on stability. Parenting plan relocations. Now, interestingly, and I, I, uh, there's a whole lot of blank space there. Sorry about that. Uh, but in around the year 2000, the legislature had to address this issue of what if a parent wants to relocate? Now, the parent can always relocate. It's whether they want to relocate with the child. That's, that's the issue. And so, <clears throat> sorry, after uh, a series of Supreme Court cases, um, the legislature took on this issue about relocation. And it is located in 2609-410 and the subsequent uh, sections. And they are mandatory sections in a parenting plan. So it specifies in the parenting plan order um, the rules around relocation, that somebody has to give notice, you can't just move with the child, you have to give notice and an opportunity to contest the relocation. Um, but generally, you know, when parties divorce, if one has been out of the workforce for a while, it may be difficult for that person in that area, neighborhood, municipality to find a job, and they may actually need to relocate for their job. 
The standard that the legislature put in is a political compromise. It is a um, rebuttable presumption that the intended relocation with, with the child will be permitted. So it seems a little paradoxical with everything I just said about modifications, such a high bar for modifications, if they stay in the same locality, neighborhood, school district, um, but if the parent wants to move out, there is a rebuttable presumption that that will be permitted. And I think it's because people have to be able to earn a living. And so they've, cr they, they've created this um, compromise, and it was a political compromise, and there have been bills to the legislature to undo the political compromise and to, and to uh, not permit relocations with the child. Again, the parent can always relocate. That's not the issue. The issue is relocating with the child. And when, if a parent relocates to another county, another state, um, now you're talking about a substantial change to the parenting plan because the, the, um, you're not going to be able to do the, the, in, in, the media, in the middle of the week transfers. You're going to have to do some kind of you know, more global, dare I say, makeup time, you know, where you get six weeks in the summer to try to um, adjust for the parenting time that was lost in the, in the move. So the, um, this is a political compromise. It is a little paradoxical to what I said about modifications. It doesn't come up as much, but in a bad economy, it can come up even more if people feel they need to move. I'll say re really briefly, there's an address confidentiality program through the Secretary of State's office so that if there's been a history of violence, domestic violence, um, threats, uh, fear, people do not have to give their address. They can use um, a P.O. box through the Secretary of State's office to protect themselves and their children. I will just say before I start on child support, the other thing that I wanted to mention that we now have in Washington is under that substantial change of circumstances, the legislature has added, because we have Joint Base Lewis McCord here, um, and and we have um, the naval base on Whidbey, that, that a parent cannot use a, the other parent's deployment status as a substantial change of circumstances. Because what you can imagine what would happen in a contentious divorce is you wait for your spouse to be deployed and say, oh, well now I'm gonna be the, the non-moving party. Well, she's been deployed, I'm gonna go and try to change the entire parenting plan. So, um, the legislature changed this a number of years ago. That cannot be used as a, as a substantial change of circumstances. And in fact, allows in a deployment for the deploying parent to nominate a person to step into their shoes and to take the parenting time for them. So I think generally this was considered as um, uh, you know, grandparents would step into the shoes and they would be the one who would have the parenting time for the, um, with the child while the, while the parent is deployed. But it also could apply to same-sex partners where if one of them is, if let's say a, couple, a heterosexual couple splits up and let's say the, the woman comes out and now she has a new partner who's also a woman uh, and then she gets deployed, then her partner or wife could step into her shoes and be the, be the, um, the substitute of, during the parenting time, which would put the ex-husband and the new wife uh, possibly into contention. Maybe not, hopefully not, but could possibly uh, be one of those. And that would go, if there was a contest, that would go to the trial judge. And as I said before, in parenting, the best interest of the child is the prevailing standard and the judge has great discretion. So whatever happens at the trial court would most likely be the, how the outcome of the case because it probably wouldn't go on appeal. So something to think about in working with military clients. As I said before, if there is a dissolution with children, you must have a parenting plan and must have a child support order. 
The, the state cares about parenting plans because it wants nominally for children to know where, where children are going to be, wants them to know. But the state cares a lot about child support because the more money it collects in child support, the less the state has to provide in public assistance. There is a definite economic incentive here for child support. I'm not blaming the state. Believe me, I'm not blaming the state. This is hundreds of millions of dollars at stake, but both in collections and also in what's called cost avoidance, where the more that's collected, the less the state has to pay out in benefits. So it works for everybody and for the state to, uh, to, know, the, um, uh, to know that parents are supporting the children, not the state. We use what's called an, an income shares model, where you um, put together the, the um, combined monthly net income of the parents and then you figure out a basic child support obligation based on a table that is in the statute. 26.19.020 is the economic table. Uh, and it goes by a proportion of their earnings. The questions that come up with child support are how do you define what is income and what are allowable deductions? And the legislature has defined income very broadly and allowable deductions rather narrowly. So you get the biggest N to work with in terms of child support. And then you figure out, based on this table, based on the number in, these, in this table, what is, how much does it cost to raise a child? Well, the table has not been changed in 20 years. It, um, the, it's not for lack of trying, the legislature has tried. The, um, and so whether the number that's in the table has anything to do with the actual cost of raising a child is, you know, hearsay at best. Um, and then, as I say to my students, there's always the real world problem, there's never enough money. So there's, there's never going to be enough money um, when two people have to live separately, they, there was much more money when the two people lived together. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. So, okay. There's a question from the audience. So my question is, if the child really does split their time 50-50 with each parent, is there still the issue of, um, th this issue does it still arise? Or, I mean, especially if the, the parents have very different incomes? Or is the fact that each parent has the child 50% of the time null and void of this issue? So the question is what to do with a 50-50 shared plan when it comes to child support and whether the 50-50 whether the sharing of time will cancel out the child support obligation. So in Washington, child support and parenting time are completely separate. So again, to use Oregon as an example, you, the more parenting time you take, the less your child support is, they decrease it based on parenting time. Then, of course, you get the, then everybody's going to claim to be parent of the year and uh, want to decrease their child, child support obligation. But in Washington, they are very separate. They're, the statute allows in very, in very limited cases for people with a shared parenting plan to have, um, to, uh, I don't want to say cancel out, but essentially that's what it is doing, canceling out the child support if it doesn't work a hardship on the other parent. So if they have a 50-50 shared parenting, but one parent makes five times what the other one makes, there's still going to be a child support payment um, made because there will most likely be a hardship there as opposed to two people who make this essentially the same amount of money and share the about essentially the same amount. And again, a lot of these are done by settlement, um, but you cannot, uh, the, the thing that a judge or commissioner will look at in the final papers for dissolution is the, um, whether the child support worksheets have been filled out completely and, and what, is the, what is the child support that is supposed to be paid. So there have, been, um, there have been bills to the legislature to um, require 50-50 parenting plans. You know, notice we don't have that. I didn't mention that in the slide. Uh, to require 50-50 parenting plans 
um, as the default. Um, but the legislature has determined thus far that the trial judge or the parties should be the ones to, to figure out what's in the best interest of the child and not be hamstrung by, the, by a specific amount of time. So I'm getting the move along sign. Uh, so the, uh, the other thing that, come, that has to be addressed in a dissolution is the property division. So marriage is a financial partnership in Washington. When people get married or if they are in state registered domestic partnerships, the partnership is seen the, as a community effort of the two parties. The, each member is presumed to act in the best interests of the partnership, uh, and the contribution is to the common good, regardless of their individual con contribution. So the number one thing that I hear that's an error when, when parties come to me about a dissolution is they say, I earn the money, it's mine. Sorry, not true. In Washington, not true. It is a community effort, and so the community is the benefit. And the trial court will not look backwards at the determinations and agreements that a couple made during the relationship of who went to work where. If the parties have no prenuptial agreement or some property division um, agreement, then there are four tasks for resolving property division. You have to identify and locate and define every property and liability that the couple has. You have to classify it, whether it is community property or separate property. Are the debts community prop debts or separate debts? You have to value the property, how much is it worth? And then you have to divide it, distribute it, who gets what. Property identification, some of the easy ones, obviously, are real property, accounts, anything that comes with a balance statement. Those are the easy ones, the harder ones, uh, and certainly tangible personal property, cars, rugs, couches. Um, but then harder ones, frequent flyer miles, Xbox, Xbox files, I don't even know what you call them. Um, Computer-based assets, uh, what's in your iTunes? Because this could be a substantial amount of money that was spent by the parties to you know, to, to, to pay to iTunes for your music collection, and now it has to be divided up. And some things are divided up more easily than others. In Washington, we have a small area for separate property. Separate property is generally just these three things. The property held before the marriage, property from gift or inheritance that's directed to a particular party, uh, and property acquired after the parties separate. And then community property is presumed to be everything else. And so the separate property is, goes in one column, and then the community property is generally what is divided. In Washington, property acquires the characteristic of either separate or community, it attains that characterization at the time it was acquired. So it doesn't change over time unless the parties do something to what's called commingle the property. Um, and, uh, and then what's called the progeny rule is that property that was characterized as one thing, if you sell it and then use those proceeds to do something else with it, retains the same property of its initial character. You haven't, as long as you haven't added anything from the communal effort into it, then it remain, retains its separate property. Generally, generally people aren't, because the presumption goes toward community property, generally, if anything, people are, are um, concerned about what is their separate property. Then it has to be valued, and there are people out there who do this valuing, and then it has to be distributed. And then, so valued and then distributed according to the property rules and without regard to marital misconduct. Although some, somebody may claim that they should get more property because somebody was mean to them or because they had an affair, in fact, we don't, we don't consider property, we don't consider marital misconduct in property distribution or in dealing with what we call maintenance, spousal support, also known as alimony. The, we are a completely no fault 
state and a completely no-fault country. So fault doesn't get figured into this. I'll just say about maintenance, there are a lot of urban myths about maintenance that you know you get one year of maintenance for every four mar years married or I'm entitled to maintenance. Fact is that generally the, the, the goal is for to use the property distribution to do a clean break between the parties and only to use maintenance in a couple of rare instances where either there's a rehabilitation need where one party needs to go back to work and they don't have the skills to be self-sufficient, so they need maintenance to get them kind of over that hump so that they can be self-sufficient and then not rely on the other party anymore. And then otherwise, the maintenance is used for um, if the property division can't create a clean break, you can use maintenance to compensate somebody for a, uh, for a property asset that they weren't able to get or divide. Um, it is payable until death of either or until the recipient remarries. Or it could be time limited in the order. Um, and it is income. It is taxable to the recipient and tax deductible to the payor. 40% of children in this, in this country are born where the, parent, where the bio mom puts unmarried on the birth certificate. Now, I don't believe that that means that 40% are single. I just think that it means the forms haven't caught up with the changes in families. But so when there, is, when there are unmarried parents, the law under 2626, uh, Washington's Uniform Parentage Act, will step in and fill in for the, um, in terms of the legal rights of the parents. And there are a number of different ways that one can become a parent. Bi biologically and by adoption are two of them, but Washington also acknowledges genetic testing and adjudication, being held out as a child, uh, being a, a parent holding out their child as their own, uh, a pre-birth legal determination, we actually don't have that uh, yet in Washington, we might sometime soon, and what's called de facto parent, where one parent has allowed another person to come into the home and establish a parent-like relationship with the child. Presumption of, mar of parentage applies to same-sex couples or uh, of married or who are married or are state registered domestic partnerships. The courts will look to the intent of the parties rather than look to genetic testing. So Washington rewrote its par Uniform Parentage Act in 2011 and focuses much more on the intent of the parties rather than the actual genetic link to determine who should be the parent. I'll say very quickly about surrogacy. Washington has what's called compensated, uh, has what's called compassionate surrogacy, which means that a woman could carry a child for a, another person or a couple, um, but not receive any compensation for it. Um, after the infamous Baby M case from New Jersey in 1988, in 1989, Washington enacted very strict um, uh, um, prohibitions against compensated surrogacy. Touch really briefly on an adoption. Uh, when there is an adoption, the birth parents have 48 hours after the birth of the child to make their final determination. Both parents must have notice of the intention to, to relinquish. This comes up a lot with, you know, the stereotypical young single girl who didn't tell the, tell the father of the baby that he was going to be the father. Uh, they must have no, uh, notice. They, um, there is no age limit in Washington to be adopted, but you must be 18 or older to adopt someone. Um, adoptive parents must have a home study evaluation um, prior to adopting a child, and Washington has no prohibitions against same-sex uh, adoption. And since 2013, adoptees can get a copy of their original birth certificate um, unless the parent has filed a certificate of non-disclosure or an affidavit of non-disclosure, and that is a mistake. It should say uh, they expire at death, not at birth. <laughs>
And then, as I mentioned before, there still could be, even in this day and age, hostile jurisdictions. And so couples have to think when they travel to places that historically are not supportive of LGBT folks, whether or not they need to do additional legal protections for their parental rights. And in the area of parentage, it might be uh, encouraging people to still do a second parent adoption even though by law this, when the parties were married when the child was born which would make the spouse the presumed parent of that child and yet um, there are still jurisdictions where that might be a battle and so better you know better to be protected than to worry about one's rights I don't know if we have time for questions. Uh, apparently not. Well, thank you very much, and um, enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>